Right. Well, uh, thanks, Shin, and uh, I guess for, I should thank uh, Fernando and the other organizers uh, for the opportunity to be part of this program, and then again for the second opportunity to give this talk. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, so I want to talk about min-max theory today for uh, prescribed mean curvature uh, hypersurfaces. Uh, essentially everything I'll talk about, well, really everything I'll talk about is joint uh, with Shin himself. Uh, so my plan today is uh, to sort of first introduce the problem of prescribed curvature. Uh, and then, because I think the only way to learn min-max, or maybe any maths in general, is to hear it a hundred different times. So I want to go through the min-max procedure um, in a sort of rough fashion, enough to convince you of uh, at least sort of what we'll prove is that we can carry out our theory for a certain class of prescription functions, and so I want to convince you uh, first why we're looking at that class, and then sort of talk about that, and then maybe after the break, uh, sorry, so that's what I mean by here I'll talk about the compactness theory, so I'll convince you that we need a good compactness theory, and that for this particular class of functions we have a good compactness theory, uh, and then after the break, then we'll try and really dive right in and see how far we get and really talk about the, uh, the min-max theory in detail. Okay. So that's my plan for the talk. Okay. All right. So if I have a, a hypersurface, And let's say this is just a closed Ramanian manifold. We'll say that uh, sigma has prescribed mean curvature, or PMC, uh, given by an ambient function If at all points, uh, the mean curvature of sigma is exactly the restriction of this ambient function h. Okay. Okay. So what, again, what's going on is I'm taking an ambient function, and that's going to prescribe my curvature at all points on this uh, hypersurface. So I know there are a lot of experts in the room, so I, I kind of want to do a condensed review. Um, but these arise uh, in a lot of different contexts. So, of course, Fernando gave this great talk yesterday uh, for the h equals zero case. That's minimal hypersurfaces. Uh, of course, if h is a constant, it's kind of uninterestingly called constant mean curvature hypersurfaces, or CMC. Uh, and so they show up in isoparametric problems, of course, uh, interface phenomena, uh, general relativity, Maybe I should mention, uh, just as a side note, because it came up in Chow's talk as well, so in particular in the capillary problem, Chow was talking about capillary minimal surfaces, uh, but you could also think about capillary surfaces with constant mean curvature, or in fact with prescribed mean curvature, or corresponding to the action of uh, gravity or some other forces. Um, okay. So of course these are so variational methods in geometry program. So these are variational. So PMC hypersurfaces are critical points of a certain functional, and we'll denote it by AH. So to find this functional. We can just compute our favorite things. So if I compute the first variation of area, so we all know this is going to be uh, governed by the mean curvature. So here the variation field, so for a variation 
by the field X. Of course, uh, what's happening to the area is totally governed by the mean curvature. On the other hand, if uh, sigma bounds a region, then the first variation of volume, so of course this is just the integral of 1, that's just going to pick up the motion of the boundary. Right? And so, of course, if I stick in an h everywhere, so if I vary the h volume, the integral of h, uh, then I just pick up the function again in this integral. And so you can see that these PMC hypersurfaces are critical points of AH, where this is the area of the boundary of excuse me, area of the boundary minus the H volume on the interior. Okay. So again, just for a little bit of a review, uh, in the local setting, there's quite a bit of work done. Uh, of course, both in these constant cases of uh, zero or constant mean curvature, uh, but also in the, in the more general case of uh, having a prescription function. So by the local setting, I really mean the Dirichlet or, or plateau problem. And uh, again, I'm going to sort of skip over a great many works, but let me just mention a few names to say that I did. So Hildebrandt, uh, Gulliver, Joel Spruck, so there's quite a few works uh, in this line which I've sort of broadly characterized by a sort of parametric approach, right? So corresponding to the mapping problem uh, with a prescribed boundary. Um, there's sort of a, a small issue here where you might have a restriction on the mean curvature that you can actually prescribe with this method. Uh, in some cases, it is optimal uh, given the, the boundary. Right, so given a boundary, you, you know, certainly might not be able to prescribe any mean curvature. Uh, but in, so, in quite a lot of the cases, there's a further restriction on H for technical reasons. So let me just throw a few other names out there. So Klaus Gerhardt, Giaquinta and Juicy that I've grouped in here, uh, not because they all start with G, but because this is a sort of non-parametric approach. So again, writing it as a graph. Uh, and often uh, what we found for these results uh, is that H typically depends, or they typically uh, need to restrict to H that depends only on the horizontal or vertical directions. Okay. So only for certain particular classes of H right, in space. Okay. Okay. That's my very quick review of the local setting. In the global setting, which is what I'll be concerned with uh, in this talk, we're looking for closed hypersurfaces. Uh, and in this setting, there's really not much. Right? So if you've heard this talk before, uh, for the constant mean curvature case, even in that case, there really isn't too much uh, done for, uh, for, for existence in general of a closed uh, constant mean curvature hypersurface with prescribed mean curvature. Right? And then even less uh, in the general case of, of uh, ambient prescription function. Okay. Um, so let me 
mention that this was sort of asked by Yao. For surfaces, uh, not quite in a closed ambient manifold, but in R3. And there are some partial results. Uh, again, very, very broadly, in either special manifolds or, you know, with some conditions. So what I had in mind uh, when I wrote this here was, so for instance, there's this work of Meeks, Mira, Perez, and Ross for homogeneous three manifolds where they can construct uh, CMC spheres of the, of the optimal range of mean curvatures. Okay. Again, uh, sorry. The Euclidean case is the Yao's question for closed surfaces or? Uh, it should be closed surfaces in R3, I think. So for, for which uh, positive prescription functions do, do there exist a closed surface in R3 with prescribed mean curvature. Uh, and in terms of some special situations, just, so just for example, uh, this work of Gerhardt uh, assumes the existence of barriers. Which somehow makes sense. So if you have, uh, if you have already two CMC surfaces, then you can sort of try and get things in between. Right. So if you already have barriers, you can try and do it. Uh, Fernando was kind enough to mention geodesics yesterday, so I think I have some license to do so as well. So in the one D case, uh, we're looking at prescribed geodesic curvature. Uh, which, of course, don't correspond to periodic orbits of the geodesic flow, but these correspond to periodic orbits under a magnetic field. Okay. So essentially, the, the magnetic field provides you your prescription function, and then if you successfully find this closed loop or magnetic geodesic, that's your periodic orbit. Uh, this was actually a problem. This was a problem posed by Arno and uh, separately Novikov around the 50s. Uh, in the case M is S2 with some metric. Uh, unfortunately, so we, we can't solve this. This is still uh, very much open. So there was some initial progress uh, due to these two people uh, using different approaches. And then much more recently in the 2000s, uh, Howard Rosenberg and James Smith have an approach uh, using the degree, the degree theory of Brian White to try and approach it, uh, but still very far uh, from being solved. Again, even in the constant case. Yeah, I think so. Sorry, yes, that's right. So, uh, I think for the for the general functions, immersed is, might still be open. Yeah, but certainly for for simple, even the constant case is not known. No, I don't think so. Not not for not for every possible uh, curvature. Right. So it's open. You can you can get some range, but it's certainly not everything, or or known to be optimal. Okay. Okay. On the other hand, uh, if I do start restricting my prescription functions, uh, then we really get somewhere. Right. So I think everyone has heard, again, this h equals 0 case. So this is the classical Umgren pits. Uh, 
min-max theory. And so the theorem, if I manage to state it correctly, uh, is so. So given an ambient manifold, uh, let's say, between uh, of ambient dimension between three and seven, there exists a smooth closed embedded hypersurface sigma with uh, mean curvature zero. So I think I haven't done anything silly. And again, thanks to Lou for the question. Again, uh, the crucial point here is that we find embedded surfaces, right? smoothly embedded hypersurfaces. Uh, I should say, I think uh, Fernando mentioned this as well. If we want to go to higher dimensions, of course, uh, the regularity theory of Shane Simon says that you should allow a singular set of co-dimension 7. Right? But otherwise, uh, the theorem continues to hold. Right? So you still get existence of this, uh, of this closed hypersurface that's minimal of, or prescribed mean curvature 0. Uh, it's just embedded away from this singular set of co-dimension 7. So, last year, I want to say. <laughs> so in the constant case, let's say non-zero. So this is my work with uh, Shin from last year. OK, so this one is Shin, and this one's me. <laughs> um, so we managed to prove. Uh, that for any constant, uh, you can still run the min-max theory and still produce a closed hypersurface with the right mean curvature that you wanted. Okay. So the theorem is given this ambient manifold with the same dimensional restrictions. And if you give me a constant, uh, then there exists this hypersurface Smooth closed and the mean curvature is everywhere equal to C. So I've left out a space and the only difference is that now we have to allow our hypersurface to be what we call almost embedded. So it seems like we lose something. Uh, I'll make a remark in, the mo in a moment to say that we actually uh, gain something in other places. Okay. But to preempt the question, uh, almost embedded is going to mean so it's immersed, but we can't have a, a genuine crossing. Right? So the only type of uh, singularity is a touching singularity. So the hypersurfaces can just touch. So you can have a self-touching. Uh, a priori, we don't exclude another sheet. Uh, but actually, in our theorem, we prove that you can only have two sheets. So maybe I should do it in red. So we have at most two sheets touching at a touching point. Uh, so the best we can do, uh, the best we can do is that the touching set uh, has co-dimension one in the hypersurface. Has but do you expect that to be sharp? Uh, so the danger is that you could always have 
in principle, you could have two hypersurfaces touching along, for example, surfaces touching along the line, right? Just take cylinders. Um, we would freely conjecture uh, that maybe generically uh, we can actually split it apart entirely. Right? So we w one would hope that there's no touching set, uh, at least generically, but we can't prove that for now. Right, it's possible. So, Yeah, I think as Shin says, that's the danger and why you don't sort of get a cheap resolution of the multiplicity one conjecture. So we can't rule out this uh, multiplicity happening in the limit. And you don't and get so, Jacobian Not that we know. Yeah, sure, so work in progress. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we should hope to produce a lot. Uh, is, it, is it clear there's not actually infinite? It's not clear to me. <laughs> <laughs> so certainly, for, for instance, for very large C, right, you can imagine there are lots of spheres around, or perturbations of geodesic spheres. Well, generically, maybe if there's a, a max or a min, then there's only like, for stable guys. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, so this is a uh, yeah. There are lots of questions about this. Of course, uh, we like this result. We think it opens up a lot, but we haven't we haven't done it yet. Okay. It's uh, takes time. <laughs> so instead, what we've been looking at is pushing this. Uh, for more general prescription functions, right? That's the theme of the talk. So, sort of in the past year, what we've been doing instead is to look at uh, these more general uh, smooth prescription functions. And again, we can't do all of them. It's not uh, quite that satisfying, but we can do a generic set. So the theorem is there exists a generic set in the sense that it's open and dense of smooth functions, smooth ambient functions, uh, such that uh, for any prescription function in this set, I can solve the problem. Right? So there exists a hypersurface, sorry, uh, there exists sigma. prescribed mean curvature h and the same regularity okay so it's still uh, for this generic set of prescription functions it's still almost embedded with at most two sheets at a touching uh, and with the same bound on the touching set okay yeah. sorry saying that the notion of prescribed curvature is very different in your work compared to the parametric people. So I guess that they, they literally you know, give a function on the surface to be a thing, right? While you have no control whatsoever on the actual restriction, right? Because you don't know where that sigma is going to happen. So in a way, your prescription is much weaker than those papers, if I understand correctly. I think, I think both have been studied from the parametric point of view. And again, and the same for the non-parametric. But I mean, if I think about the papers by the German school like Hildebrand, I guess they... Yeah, I think really this, 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 really this one is given on the surface, like for a, for a disk, right? 
this is what you're thinking. Yeah, because there in the end you don't really know what the curvature function is, right? On you know, so you know yeah, it's that's a restriction true. of a function in a higher dimensional manifold, but okay. So sure. You know, for the work type to learn, still yeah. they, they did work on higher problems. Yeah. Okay. So, so both problems have been studied, both prescribing it on the surface and uh, on the ambient manifold. So yeah, perhaps Hildebrand is, a, is an inaccuracy. So just, but certainly I think Oliver Sprock and Dizal. But on the other hand, if you prescribe H on the surface, you give a function, the function, the, the, the equation, at least for that term, there's no non-linearity. If you pre prescribe the function on the ambient space, H composes U, give you a non-linearity there. So I would say prescribe on ambient space is harder than prescribe on the surface. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, we can also mention a harder problem, right? So there's. Yeah, sure. You can always go harder. I mean, yeah. But a, a harder problem in the same vein, uh, for instance, that pops up in GR is you might want to. So, so I shouldn't use H. <laughs> Let's use K. Right. So K is like the second fundamental form of your space like surface. Mm -hmm. Right. So this one is not variational, so we can't do it via this sort of approach yet. But this is sort of in the same vein, right? So K is uh, defined ambiently, at least with respect to the hypersurface, and then you're taking the trace only on the hypersurface. Yeah. So is everyone happy with the theorem? So exactly the same conclusions, uh, and we can do it for this certain generic set. Right. So I should probably... Sorry? Are you allowing functions that change some? Yeah, so let, let me just describe what we can do. So uh, I'm going to do double dagger first because it's sort of the easy case, and I don't want to write double dagger all the time. So. Uh, either the zero set of H is suitably small right. so let me say a few words about this sort of what what could happen in the CMC case is this sort of touching and if you imagine sort of the, the worst example you can think of is this sort of uh, cylindrical case touching along a line, right? In the CMC case, uh, you know this is the worst because you have at least a one-sided maximum principle, right? So two CMC guys uh, shouldn't be allowed to touch, uh, so they shouldn't be allowed to come together like that. So they should only be allowed to touch in the sort of yellow situation that I drew over there. Right. Okay. Uh, for the same reason, uh, if your function, if your prescription function h doesn't change sign, you can get the same sort of bound on the touching set. Right. Just locally about that point, uh, the two sheets sort of have to repel each other a bit. Okay. So you could imagine. Uh, there's sort of no problem when, the, when H changes sign. What you worry about is if you have a touching point where H is zero. Right. So of course we'll see it again later, but if that zero set is small, in fact as small as I want to conclude for the touching set anyway, then there's no problem. At least morally. Okay, more interestingly, now I'm going to give you a, a really wall of a condition so the condition is if I have uh, if I do have a hypersurface in M and my prescription function vanishes to infinite order 
at a point P, then sigma, sorry, then the zero set of H is locally a smooth hypersurface. Uh, plus tangent to sigma p. Uh, and one more condition. And so the, we, we want a mean curvature condition on this zero set, which we've uh, assumed is a hypersurface. So the mean curvature vanishes either to finite order or identically. Sure. Right, so the point is, uh, it's some sort of unique continuation property, right? Both for uh, this, the zero set itself, right? So if I have something that's sort of touching the zero set to infinite order, the zero set should actually be smooth. And if the zero set itself satisfies this unique continuation sort of principle for its mean curvature. Okay. So my goal for the first part of this talk is to convince you, uh, well, first that it actually works for this condition, uh, and also that this, uh, this condition is somehow right. Okay. So. My remarks here are that uh, first, as we discussed, this first thing includes uh, functions with sign, uh, but of course the other condition, the one I really care about, uh, dagger down here doesn't assume any sign condition on the prescription function. Okay. So somehow dagger is like the easy, uh, sorry, double dagger is like the easy case and dagger is like the really interesting case here. Now on the other hand, this guy does include uh, some interesting functions already, so includes uh, non-zero real analytic functions if we assume that the, the manifold and the metric are real analytic, right? uh, then any uh, real analytic function little h uh, will satisfy dagger. Right? Again, it's this sort of unique continuation principle, so you, it really, uh, you should really expect it to be satisfied on an analytic function. Uh, and uh, I don't want to say is generic, but contains a generic set. Okay. Uh, so a certain we'll see a certain class of Morse functions. Okay. So I'll do this right now. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm. Uh, Sorry. Say that every function that satisfies that your theorem works. Uh, yes. So, but in the general theorem, say that you can only find the generic set. Yeah. The generic set contains every function with zero set. So, is, uh, what what I'll show is that there's a. I'm also confused by the dimension. Why n minus one? Do we want to put n minus one on n? Is that that equal zero on just a tiny set? Yeah, it, it should it should really be it should be small in the hypersurface as well. Right. Yeah. So that's h equals zero everywhere on n. On that's h equals zero where? On sigma or on m? The, the zero set is taken in m, in but it, it so it should be co-dimension two in m. Then we get the conclusions of the theorem, okay, yeah, right? So, so maybe it also helps if I throw up a lemma. No, 
of n. So I'm going to define a set S uh, that's going to be open, dense, and satisfies Dagger. Sorry, sorry. And for the second one, what's the difference between sigma and sigma now? Sorry. So sigma naught is the zero set. So and what? sigma is the solution? Yeah, what is it? Sorry. Uh, let me change up. Yeah, it's just some hypersurface. So then for any sigma, they should satisfy the following. For any sigma. So is this oh, a is sigma. okay, so is yeah. on statement so just one dagger? Maybe I should do sigma that. or sigma not are the solution given right. by the power. Take? take a hypersurface if the prescription function restricted to that hypersurface. For instance, if it's a level, if it's the zero. If it set, is the zero set itself. Right. Then? Then the zero set has to be a hypersurface. Right. So the, the situation. So yeah. the zero set, the uh, N, US, so I want to know, I want to know about the mean curvature of the zero set itself. So, the situation which we'll see is, uh, the situation is where, basically I, I want this to only vanish, I, I want this condition to only happen when sigma is actually the zero set of H. Okay. Right. I don't want to see a surface where my prescription function h vanishes to all orders, but it's not the zero set of h itself. Yeah. Does that make sense? So is it saying that the zero set has to be a minimum? No, because this is the zero set is not necessarily a solution of the prescribed mean curvature equation. Uh, just as a yeah, locally at the point p, or or in fact as a function, just locally, near p. So if it vanishes as a function, then is that not identical to? I'm confused. Sorry. Finite order at p. Either it vanishes to finite order at p, or identically n near p. Yeah, so that's that's what we're gonna do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you still have to do generic perturbation, so that that doesn't seem to be that helpful for me. I mean, your criteria dagger, I'm trying to yeah. I pick up a function, will it satisfy that or not? Yeah, so okay. let let me tell you a set yeah, that yeah, satisfies. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Maybe that'll help. Yeah. Okay. So I want to take the set of Morse functions uh, h such that the zero set uh, is a smooth closed hypersurface. In M, uh, So I want to take Morse functions uh, and first make it so that the zero set is a closed hypersurface. And then I want to also ensure that that closed hypersurface uh, cannot have mean curvature which vanishes to all orders at a point. Which point? 
at, at any point, at any point of, uh, of the zero set. Okay. Is it clear what I'm asking? Okay. So let me show. Uh, so of course, uh, we know most functions are open and dense already. So there's no worries. So as far as uh, the zero set being a closed hypersurface, I mean, we only have to rule out a handful of points, right? So we only have to rule out, sorry. So sigma naught is a closed hypersurface is actually equivalent to uh, the singular set. So h, h squared h is zero, is empty. By the implicit function theorem, and uh, for most functions, this set is finite. Right? So I can always perturb away from this finite set of points. So this first part up to here is generic, at least, and then I just want to fix this mean curvature condition on the zero set of H. Right? Okay, so to do that, uh, so for the condition. So I want to find a deformation. So I want to deform the zero set in a particular way, such that it has this unique continuation property. So it, the mean curvature doesn't vanish to infinite order at any point. And I'm just going to extend that to a deformation of H itself. Okay. Right, so I can always do that uh, just by taking whatever deformation I do on this hypersurface, I can always extend it locally to a time-dependent vector field and just take the flow of that. Right. And so for short time, I'm not changing anything about the critical structure of H, I'm not changing anything about the, the Morse property or the zero set. Right. I'm just essentially perturbing the zero set to, be one, uh, to, to what I want it to be. So it's enough to perturb the zero set, and uh, well, the idea is to run mean curvature flow. So Dan, I, I found some sort of use for mean curvature flow. Uh, so the point is that mean curvature flow is going to spread out the curvature. Right. So first, uh, I can certainly assume that the zero set is not a minimal surface, right? So I can just do almost anything to make it not a minimal surface. Right? If it is, I just put in a little bump. Um, and then once it's not, I'm just going to run mean curvature flow, and that's going to smooth out the curvature. So in particular, so this spreads out. Uh, so technically, the mean curvature satisfies this nice parabolic equation. Right, so the mean curvature satisfies this equation. Uh, and so if it vanishes to infinite order, we can use some, some unique continuation principles for very nice and linear parabolic equations. Right. So the unique, uh, sorry. So if H uh, along this flow vanishes to infinite order, at a point, so it's called the space-like strong unique continuation principle. Uh, implies that H vanishes identically. Right. So this is exactly what we wanted to say. The, the mean curvature flow should spread out this curvature. If it didn't, if you still ended up with, uh, with this point where it vanishes to infinite order, then you just had to be zero everywhere. Right. Okay. Um, but that can't happen just because uh, backwards uniqueness says that then 
your initial hypersurface was also minimal and we already did a perturbation to ensure that that didn't happen. How are we doing with the time? Okay, so are we all happy with, uh, are there any more questions about the conditions, dagger, double dagger, or the fact that they contain a generic set? Everything we do is a smooth deformation. Yeah. Okay, so I just want to very quickly go over the min-max procedure. Again, with the goal of uh, sort of convincing you why we need a crazy condition like this. <laughs> okay. So again, we're going to try and apply a min-max theory to this functional a h. Oh, so the plan, as usual, is to take a sweep out starting from the empty uh, from the empty set. Of course, has a h equal to zero. I'm also bad at drawing scaling triangles, but uh, let's pretend this is a sort of arbitrary sweep out. So, starting at the empty set and ending up with the whole manifold, and of course, a h here is just going to pick up uh, minus the h volume of m. So, what's happening here? <laughs> Uh, so it's zero here, over here, and m. We're getting some value. Uh, and if we want to do min-max, we probably don't want to pick up these two trivial solutions. Right. So we really hope that the width is greater than them. Uh, we're just going to make a technical assumption that the h volume of m is non-negative, so we can always change h by a sign. Uh, this choice also showed up in our CMC work. We always took uh, the constant c to be positive, but of course uh, you do get existence of the, the negative one as well just by flipping an orientation. Okay, so we can make this choice. Uh, then on this end we have something negative, and to pick up our critical point, our non-trivial critical point, We'd really love the functional to come up some way. Right. Okay. Uh, it turns out that we can do this. So actually, we can always show that it goes up a definite amount, uh, let's say epsilon, uh, from, from the empty set. Okay. So the claim So the reason for this is just the fact that the isoparametric profile for any closed manifold is going to be asymptotically Euclidean as the volume goes to zero. Right. So in particular, the area uh, is going to look like a smaller power of v for v close to 0. And so ah as well is also going to look like, uh, well, you know, it's equal to a minus vh, which is also going to look like this guy. Right, so the h volume 
Uh, H is just on a closed manifold, so it's certainly bounded. Right, so this guy is of a lower order. Uh, again, as V goes to zero, right? So for very small volumes, uh, this AH functional is looking like V to the N over N plus one. And so we can definitely ensure that we get at least a little bit of upswing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, then we can start to run uh, the min-max theory. So again, we take our variational space. This is going to be the space of hypersurfaces bounding a region. Um, in contrast to uh, Fernando's talk yesterday, we're not going to take uh, Z2 coefficients. We are just going to take uh, really Cacioppoli sets, <coughs> which I can never spell right. <laughs> it's like Mississippi. Uh, <laughs> sets of finite perimeter, right? So essentially what uh, the, the natural space for this problem. And we'll see that it's big enough. And of course, we're applying uh, the min-max to, uh, to this functional AH. So I want to take uh, sweep outs. Omega t with omega naught, the empty set, and omega 1, the whole set. So really genuinely sweeping out my whole manifold. And I'm going to define the h width to be our usual min-max quantity. So the info over all sweep outs. of the max uh, of this AH functional. Right. So just the usual min-max definition, uh, taking a sweep out that really genuinely sweeps out the manifold from empty to the whole thing, and maximizing the whatever functional we're looking at over that sweep out. OK, and so it follows from this that the min-max width is strictly positive. So at least certainly we get something uh, non-trivial uh, if we try and take an approximating sequence. Right. So let's take approximating sequences. So I can take a, an approximating sequence of sweep outs realizing the infimum, and then I can take uh, some slices that realize the maximum, right? Or realize the soup. And we'll call this a min max sequence. Uh, so for all of these theorems, the theorem is really that there exists a min-max sequence that converges uh, to the guy I wanted to find. Right? So all the way back to the ongren pitts theory, there exists a min-max sequence converging to the minimal hypersurface you want. The same thing for us uh, over here. There exists a min-max sequence converging to the CMC we want, uh, and again to the prescribed mean curvature that we want. Right? So there's a, a word to say about the multiplicity. So in the ongren pitts theory, uh, Fernando mentioned yesterday that you can have uh, sort of... So in the convergence, it's convergence uh, in the weak sense as a Varifold limit, you can have uh, integer multiplicity. Uh, but for us, uh, we're taking Cacioppoli sets. Uh, it turns out that for us, we can actually ensure the convergence is with multiplicity 1. So in fact, uh, what we get is only ever, in the, in the convergence as well, we only ever get the one sheet or the two sheets touching in this form. 
And again, the same conclusions hold uh, in our PMC work. Okay. So we lost a little bit on the embedding side. Uh, sort of what's happening is in the minimal case, you have the, the full maximum principle, which says that if you touch, then you have to be equal, but then you have to allow the multiplicity. Right? So we have this touching condition, uh, but then we're like, we, we can actually rule out the multiplicity. Yeah, so we'll see maybe in the second hour, uh, especially uh, we sort of remember the region, and this really helps us a lot. Right? Remember that we're bounding a region. Yeah. So like you proved that the solution is also a boundary of Cauchy polytons, and the corresponding A, C of H value is exactly this LH in this uh, new principle. We can prove like a fractional and plus or plus or plus. So, so the remark is that uh, in the Omgren pitch setting, we just had the varifold convergence with integer multiplicity. Uh, well, we didn't write it in this paper, but we wrote it in this paper. That in fact, uh, we have more than just varifold convergence to this uh, to this guy. In fact, the the limit that we find is a Cacioppoli set itself, and the, we have the convergence uh, as Cacioppoli sets. So we have a stronger convergence as well. I have to satisfy my collaborator too here, you know. <laughs> okay. Something we will know in the first work, like whether the AC value of the solution is exactly this number LH. In the second year, what is cool? So the modeling will pass to zero. So maybe we should uh, continue this discussion. In the so uh, I thought I should clear up one thing Lou asked me during the break. Uh, I've erased it now, but our theorem for CMC, of course, we don't get the multiplicity one when C is zero, right? So. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> we'll we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, okay, so I wanted to to continue with this thought uh, that we need somehow to control what can happen uh, in this limit, right? Taking limits, because if we do solve this minimization problem for a functional, we should expect to get a prescribed mean curvature guy, 
uh, and if it's a minimizer, in fact, we can expect that it's nice and smooth, it doesn't have any self-touching at all, it's just nice and embedded, but then once we take a limit, then we might uh, run into trouble. Right. So that's what we need to control. Uh, sort of the, the danger... So I think some of us are familiar with this danger, uh, but the danger is sort of running into sheets sticking together in the limit, but then coming apart in space. And again, this is a sort of a failure of a unique continuation, right? So it's minimal here, and then it's CMC or some other mean curvature out on the other two sheets, right? Uh, and there's, I think, worse situations than this that I was worried about uh, in this work, but we'll show that uh, under these can, under this condition, uh, this doesn't happen. Okay. So, the problem. Two, two minimal sheets is also bad. It, it's bad. It's bad. It's it's all bad. But this is this is this is uh, this is what we're really worried about. Okay. So the proposition is, if we take uh, these boundaries, they're smooth. Uh, almost embedded, stable, PMC equal to H, and H satisfies, again, either dagger or double dagger, uh, and these guys have bounded area. Then My guys will converge to a limit, which is still smooth, almost embedded. Uh, sorry, and the touching set has the regularity that we want. It's small enough. In particular, it's n minus one rectifiable. Okay. Uh, we can conclu conclude a little bit more that will be important, so, uh, so each component of the limit is either minimal, uh, and in this case Again, it's genuinely embedded by the maximum principle. Uh, but then, as Shin has reminded me, uh, you can have possibly integer multiplicity. Okay. On the other hand, we could pick up a non-minimal sheet. In this case, again, we lose the embeddedness, uh, but we do get the multiplicity one. Okay and the at most two sheets. And again, we started with uh, boundaries of sets here. So if we sort of follow that in, the limit is locally a boundary of an open set uh, at multiplicity one points. You should expect that if the convergence is with multiplicity one, that nothing sort of goes wrong, right? If you have multiplicity greater than one, uh, then things can collide and you lose your orientation. Okay, so let's see how to prove this, or at least a sketch. So, as I mentioned before, H is bounded and there's no problems, it's on a compact manifold, so when we blow up a prescribed mean curvature surface, it's just going to be stationary. Okay, so we do have curvature estimates for stable PMC. which just follow from the, the Shane-Simon 
uh, regularity results for minimal hypersurfaces. Right, so just a, a blow up argument. Gives you curvature estimates eventually. Uh, again, because H is just bounded by some constant. And so having curvature estimates gives you regularity. At least away from touching points, right? Well, you still have that it's a regular immersed surface, but you have no control about how much it touches. Right? So the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, we really want to make sure this is small. That's sort of the key uh, for this compactness theory and for everything we do with prescribed mean curvature hypersurfaces. It's to keep the touching set small enough that we don't need to worry about it. Okay. Okay. So again, the situation is sort of modeled on what we did for the CMC case. So if I have one hypersurface here, it's my sigma one. Let's just assume that locally it's a graph. And then I have my second guy, sigma two. It's also a graph over the same uh, tangent plane. So sigma i. And PMC. Okay, and so uh, again, in the CMC case, if you had this sort of touching, you would know on the one hand that it has to be in this configuration, and also uh, by the implicit function theorem that the touching set has to be n minus 1 rectifiable. Right? So the point in the CMC case is that, the, uh, is that they satisfy this PD, and the difference satisfies something like LU is uh, you know, twice your constant. Right, so the Hessian is non-degenerate. Okay, so for us, the, the point is to sort of get into this situation again. So, in the first case, sigma i have prescribed mean curvature h. Again, having prescribed mean curvature as a scalar is orientation dependent. Right, so in the first case, uh, they're the same in prescribed mean curvature with the same orientation. That's the forbidden case in the CMC case, right? Okay. So the point here is just now they satisfy the same quasi-linear PDE. So it looks something like uh, you know your mean curvature operator. Sorry. So the sigma, you are there. What two components, right? So these are yeah. So two different components, and uh, in the limit they're gonna touch. Uh yeah. And you can think of it like that. And what are you trying to prove? So I'm trying to show that the the goal is to show that the touching set is n minus one rectifiable. Right. Sorry. Yep. Uh, may I ask a question about the statement here? Sure. Um, so, what is the dimension? Uh, your dimensions here? Uh, everything is. Is it the, the between three and seven? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, so, is it the idea that anything bad that can happen with the mean max then you rule out because of these generic functions, right? Not everything bad that can happen. <laughs> so we still need to do some work. <laughs> right, I understand, I understand. But, um, uh, okay. <coughs> so the, should, it, should it work also, like in dimension 8, perhaps, with this approach? Yeah, I mean, somehow it's a different type of singularity, right? So it, in higher dimensions, the co-dimension 7 singular set is from the failure of the minimal surface regularity theory, right? 
Um, and it's such a small set. I and mean, somehow we think that our methods work for that anyway. So we just, as always, just exclude that set. Outside of that set, it should be almost embedded, but again, with this touching set. Yeah. Is that all right? Thanks for the question, Marco. All right, again, uh, basically, the most important thing for us to do is to make sure that the touching set is small enough. That's going to let us run through all the arguments later uh, for the min-max theory. Okay. Okay. So in the same orientation, you have two solutions of essentially the same PD. Right. So my UI satisfies H of X. And I will heavily abuse notation for the next few minutes. Right. But the point is, it's the same PD. Uh, so uh, just you know, your uh, comparison principles for, for this type of PD uh, tell you that any touching implies that you have to be the same, right? It's just the same, uh, literally the same PDE. And now I'm regretting. Okay. So there's a special mention for a, a case in between, right? and. Uh, if I get to it, this sort of idea will come up again. So one sheet, doesn't matter which sheet, is PMC and minimal. Right, so this means that the mean curvature on sigma, uh, sigma i, is going to be h restricted sigma i, which is actually zero. Right. But in this case, uh, then you know that it's still PMC with respect to the opposite orientation. Right. So I, I flip the orientation, but then I flip the sign of zero, which is still zero. Uh, and so then I get back into case one. Okay. I can always fix the orientation so that they're the same. Right, they're PMC with respect to the same orientation. Okay. The dangerous case is the case where you have opposite orientation. Right, so in the CMC case, you can have opposite orientation, uh, which will give you this, but only approaching in this configuration. But now we don't have a sign on H, and we still need to, to control the touching set. Okay. Okay, so again I have my these guys and they satisfy my PD. And so if they're PMC in the opposite orientation, uh, then in fact I have to change a sign here, right? So uh, so what I can do is consider the difference. Similar to the CMC case again. And then the difference is going to satisfy a linear PDE, but with this uh, inhomogeneous term. Right, so you can, you can double think if uh, we were looking at. Minimal surfaces, right, the difference between two sheets is going to be a solution of like the Jacobi equation. If I have uh, two CMCs, then again, I just get that constant on the right hand side here. Right. Okay. 
And so, as I sort of mentioned before, the idea uh, before with the CMC, you had non, uh, non-degenerate Hessian. Here, the idea is that finite vanishing order tells you that the zero set is uh, co-dimension one rectifiable, at least. Okay, so this is the principle. Uh, in fact, this is a theorem that I don't want to state because I think I'll get some conditions wrong, but essentially this is a theorem of uh, Christian Barr there. So essentially it says this for smooth functions, if you have finite vanishing order, then your zero set is uh, n minus one rectifiable. So smooth functions on like Rn, say. Co-dimension one rectifiable. Uh, there's other examples, so the, again, the easy example that we had before is if, for example, the gradient is non-zero, then the implicit function theorem says that your zero set is a hypersurface or yeah, non-degenerate Hessian. Uh, there's also a result of Hart-Simon that does better right, for solutions. So, so for solutions of an elliptic equation, uh, the singular set where both the function and the gradient vanish is actually co-dimension two rectifiable. But this is the principle we're working on, uh, and so I think everyone's sort of putting the pieces together now, uh, that again, this sort of condition is necessary, right? This is why I'm so concerned uh, about the unique continuation and the vanishing order. In this limit? Yeah, yeah. You have an either or, right? So the, there are no examples where you get something minimal in the limit without your assumption. Wait, you take the linear function as a theorem. Yeah. Uh, okay. So your, your function h, I see, I see. under this assumption, your function h could still have a large zero set. And then you could just be picking up a minimal surface in the zero set. Okay, so let me run through uh, all the cases. So let's uh, work near, po near point P. Uh, so if H, if P is non-zero, uh, then we're back in our friendly non-degenerate case. Right? So this is telling us that LV and P is non-zero, and so we're done. Right. In this case, the Hessian of the difference is non-degenerate, so the touching set uh, is n minus one rectifiable. Right. Okay. So then it remains to bound the set sigma one intersect sigma two intersect the zero set of H. And again, at this point, we see we're totally done if we assume that the zero set of h is small, right? In particular, if this is n minus one rectifiable, then we just give up and we're done. Right. Okay. So let's suppose h of p is zero. Again, if these guys touch to finite order, at P, uh, then we can use, ooh. yeah, sorry. I should have said, in this Hart-Simon theorem, 
uh, you actually need it to be finite vanishing order first before you conclude the stronger thing that it's n minus two rectifiable. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. So Hart Simon says that if you have finishing, finite vanishing order a priori, then you actually get better than n minus one rectifiable for solutions. You get n minus two rectifiable. In any case. Uh, so if these guys touch to finite order, then you do use the hard Simon bound, and you're all good. On the other hand, if they touch to infinite order at my point P, then I take this is the case uh, that I can't rule out, that I don't know how to rule out by another method. So here's where I want to use my big assumption. Okay, so the picture is, uh, I've got my two sheets, and according to this assumption, I've also got the zero set of H lying around. Not necessarily in between, but that's just how I've drawn it. Okay. Right. So in this situation, if I have an infinite order vanishing, you can check this implies that H vanishes right. just because, again, V satisfies this equation. So V vanishes to infinite order, so the right-hand side does. Um, and so I produce by supposition the zero set as a hypersurface in this picture. Okay. Okay, so now I want to compare either sheet to the zero set instead of with each other. Okay. So now... Uh, right. So I want to write, I want to rewrite my surfaces as graphs over the zero set. So up there in my PD, that H naught is going to be exactly the mean curvature of the zero set. Right. Okay. So then I want to look at the. Sorry. So then the set I want to look at, sigma one intersect sigma two, intersect the zero set, is at least contained in the set. where all these functions I'm considering are zero, the common zero set of all these functions. Okay. So if ui vanishes to finite order, uh, then we're done, right? Because I can bound the zero set of the graph and I know that the set I'm looking for is just contained in the common zero set anyway, right? At least locally. Yeah. Okay. So the last case is where both UI vanish to infinite order. At P. Right. Okay, but in this case, uh, for small x, sorry, for maybe I should set up a coordinate system here.
So the point is, as I go into the point P that I'm considering, my quasi-linear operator resembles the Laplacian, right, strongly and strongly, uh, and because H is smooth, or in fact really you only need Lipschitz, uh, H is bounded by a uh, constant times the, the graph function. Right? So just by comparing, uh, for example, a point here and a point on the zero set. Right? So the distance is like the difference between the graphs, and that can't be large, right? It has to go to zero. Okay. Okay, well, the upshot of this is to have this uh, elliptic differential inequality. Uh, where again, the coefficient matrix is very close to the Laplacian. And uh, in this situation, there's actually a strong unique continuation for elliptic differential inequalities. Right? So then uh, you find out that they have to coincide. Right? All the sheets have to coincide and be minimal, right? because you can just iterate this argument on all the other points. And then this will contradict uh, this guy. Right? Okay, so the upshot is, if you have this sort of really bad touching, infinite order touching, you actually have to touch the zero set to infinite order, and then you have to just coincide, right? Everything collapses, and you're just a minimal surface in the zero set. Okay, that's the only way that anything bad can happen. Okay. How are we feeling? Okay, uh, so given this, I, I hope I've sort of convinced you why unique continuation and this sort of vanishing order condition is important. And then I want to move on uh, to some details about the min-max process, uh, which is actually almost the same between uh, CMC and PMC, right? So we discovered that once you set it up correctly for CMC, it's quite flexible. And uh, once you control the touching set, then you're all good and uh, sort of the techniques we developed still work for the PMC case, as long as you, again, control the touching set. Okay, so I told several lies earlier when I described the min-max. Um, uh, but let me tell some more lies and try and clean it up uh, just a little bit now. So again, we produced a non-trivial solution and the only thing left to do is to prove its regularity. So again, we had a tightening map uh, in the minimal case so when h is zero, we show that it's stationary, right? So we apply some sort of map, produce a new sequence uh, for which the limit is actually stationary, right? I mean, if we couldn't do this, we'd be in real trouble because we're trying to find a critical point. Right. Okay. We also show that it has a sort of uh, more direct variational property. So typically one shows that it's epsilon, uh, the sequence, Minimizing. Okay. That is to say, uh, you cannot decrease the functional by more than epsilon along deformations 
which do not increase by more than epsilon over 4, say. Right. So I want to restrict to deformations that don't uh, do too much, right? So the picture that I think was discussed over here was if we have something in the minimal case like two planes, you know, you might say that, well, you can do better with this, right? But how are you going to cross into that situation, right? So you might have to go through something like pushing these guys down. Again, we're just considering h equals zero, that's the area functional. You might have to go through, uh, for instance, something in the middle here, which has larger area. So if you disallow this, this uh, parallel configuration might be uh, almost minimizing in some sense, but just as a flavor. Okay. <coughs> then the point is to construct replacements. By minimizing in this class, so I want to take all those deformations, all the endpoints you could produce without increasing the functional too much, right? And whatever I can do, uh, I want to minimize over that, right? So it's some sort of minimization problem. Uh, and it turns out uh, this is where the regularity will come in. Okay, but again, I've lied another time because it's not almost minimizing globally. It's not even almost minimizing on balls. Uh, it's actually almost minimizing only on small annuli. Okay, so this is a essentially review. So really this is only step one. Step two is we do concentric replacements so the picture is I can construct something good on this annulus let me not draw this side and then I want to take my replacement and do something else over here Right. in the hopes that actually these were the same and then I can just contract this and construct a replacement on the whole ball. Right. So. And again at the very end I want to say that what I started with uh, matches with the replacements that I did. Right? So you can see again, in all of these steps, we really do need a unique continuation principle. And again, for PMC, uh, it's a corollary of the touching set estimate that you have a unique continuation. Right? So in particular, you certainly can't have this really bad picture with a split because of course this touching set is huge, right? This is like an n-dimensional touching set. Okay, so there are a number of uh, difficulties here for the CMC case that we had to overcome. So one issue is, uh, is that stationary is not necessarily well defined once we take the varifold limit. So we mentioned before that, you know, uh, a posteriori, uh, we can show that in fact the sequence converges as Cacioppoli sets, but a priori it's just a varifold limit, right? So we could lose the orientation, and so it's not clear how to actually define uh, the functional even, right? Much less the, the critical points. So we need to somehow, we needed to somehow replace this class, and so what we did uh, for CMC was to take bounded first variation. Okay. So it turns out that just forgetting about the orientation was okay. 
So we could still have uh, several key things. So one was the we still have a, an almost monotonicity formula. We can still take blow ups, right? So if we have bounded first variation again, just like we did before, if the. Bounded first variation for the area function. Yeah. If you don't like it, you can just think of it as bounded mean curvature, essentially, right? So the, the point is that uh, with bounded mean curvature, the blow-up is still uh, stationary. Right? So we get uh, quite a few things that we still want to use. Um, the remark is that this was kind of subtle to work out, right? Uh, it seems like a simple condition, but you actually need to find, uh, you know, this is somehow weaker than stationary, right? You might expect. But it's still the point is that it's still enough to finish the rest of the scheme. Okay, so it's not uh, totally obvious that this is the right class, but we found that it is. Uh, once you know that it is, of course, you can see that it should really also be the right class for prescribed mean curvature, right? Not just constant, because it's just it's fairly weak, right? It's just bounded. If you look at the theory, the only place that he used stationarity is to rule out the limit is a point mass. Precisely, you don't need stationarity at all. So that's a very big step. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. So over here, we also have some issues. So when we construct the replacements, uh, what we saw in the minimal case, again, you just get a smoothly embedded guy. Right? And so you're, you're very happy, even when taking the limits, you still remain with a smoothly embedded guy, uh, possibly up to some multiplicity, right? But here uh, we have lower regularity, in particular, we only know that it's almost embedded, so we do need to, we did need to come up with the method to deal with the touching points, right? Uh, and in particular, to perform this sort of unique continuation or gluing argument in the vicinity of a touching point. Okay, so another issue that comes up is that you pick up a mass defect, again, uh, from the cancellation and from uh, issues with keeping track of the orientation. Right, so when you do the replacement, you know, in this sort of uh, energy point of view, you might expect to get the same energy. Right? Uh, the problem is, again, in this limit, we might lose some mass, uh, but we actually found that we can control the mass you lose uh, by a constant times uh, the m plus 1 volume of u, where u is the replacement uh, annulus, let's say. And so one of the themes, as we saw before, is that the area functional is actually a, a, a dominant term. Right? So this uh, C times volume U is actually fine, uh, at least under the process of blow-ups. Right? So in particular, uh, we're able to recover some of the regularity using the H equals zero or minimal theory uh, by taking a blow-up, in which case the mass defect disappears. And uh, perhaps the most serious issue, or the most delicate issue, is in this unique continuation argument. So again, we really wanted to show that when we took the first replacement, let's call it V prime, and then we took a replacement of V prime to get V double prime. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Um, what is the mass effect? I didn't get that part. Sorry, when we take the replacement um, on your sequence, you could actually, like the mass of the boundary could, could differ because you don't, you, you sort of lose track a little bit of the open set, right? But, um, right, we're doing this minimization uh, of the AH functional in this class of deformations that doesn't increase it. So you lose a little bit of control on the mass, but you still have control on the AH and that tells you that the mass defect is controlled by the lower order term, right? Right, AH is the area minus the H volume, so the difference in area is controlled by the difference in H volume, right? And so that's why we get uh, 
we, we, we lose a little bit of control, but we, we still recover something. Enough to take a blow up. Okay. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is just this unique continuation. Right, so over here, uh, in the minimal picture, you want to glue these guys together. You want to show that, in fact, the tangent cone here has to be a plane. And really, you want to show that the red is actually just an extension of the blue into the center. Right? You don't want it to be some totally different surface. Right? The whole point was uh, that V double prime should be uh, an extension into the center. Um, and to show this in the minimal case, you sort of get away with proving a little less. Right? You don't care about the orientation of a minimal guy as we saw before in PMC as well, you can always flip the orientation. Right? So it's actually enough to, to show that the tangent planes coincide. But for us, um, it's sort of crucial to know that this guy was a boundary with this orientation because we're going together CMCs. And again, CMC depends on the orientation. Right? So we need to show that they don't just match up in the tangent plane sense, but the normals also match up. OK, and so for that, uh, it involves keeping, again, really careful track of the boundary sequence. So maybe I should, uh, I, I don't want to do another hour worth of technical stuff, so maybe I'll stop it here. And if you have questions, we can do specific stuff. We can pick and choose. So.